Um, so welcome to this uh, next episode in the, the Catalysis Hub webinars. It's my very great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Harish Manya, who's a senior lecturer at Queen's Belfast University in the Chemistry and Chemical Engineering Department, and he works in sustainable energy and catalysis, and he's going to talk to us today about why robust metal oxide catalysts hold the key to a sustainable future. I'll hand straight over to you, Harish. <laughs> Thank you, Josie. And first of all, uh, I would really, really like to thank UK Catalysis Hub for organizing this wonderful series of the webinars. It's not just this one, but uh, all the webinars in the series are very, very informative. So thank you so much for doing a great job for organizing the series of these se seminars. And uh, also thanks a lot for inviting me today to share some of the research that we are doing here at Queen's. As you can see that we have got a beautiful building of Queen's behind my screen. And uh, we always, uh, from time to time, keep on getting sunny weather with blue skies here. So this is an evidence in front of you. Right, so the topic uh, for today is uh, why do we think that the metal oxides catalyst hold the key to the sustainable future? So the sustainability requires that we have advanced manufacturing techniques that are green, environmentally benign, friendly to the environment, minimize the waste formation in the products, but at the same time, improve the efficiency in terms of the energy efficiency of the process and increase the yield of the products as well. So uh, as uh, we can see that uh, one of the, at the moment, uh, more than 100 countries around the world have globally, they have, uh, embraced the net zero target, which is popularly known as 2050 net zero target. And UK was the one of the first countries to, as recommended by the Committee on the Climate Change, they actually made it a legislation that uh, we did want, we do want to achieve the 2050 net zero target, which is one of the most ambitious in the world. Now, how do we want to achieve this? So if we want to develop a sustainable world around this, we need decarbonization. So we need to embrace the circular economic approach. In terms of that, we need to embrace the renewability. So the materials which we are making, the products which we are manufacturing, and the fuels which we are consuming, the energy which we are using, utilizing for our day-to-day -day life, all of it needs to be of the renewable origin so that we can rely on the circular economic approach rather than the old concept of relying on the fossil fuels. So we want to move away from the crude oil so that we can rely more on the sustainable renewable fuels and chemicals of renewable origin, which will help us to move a step closer towards the sustainability and to achieve our 2050 net zero target. Currently, as we can see, the current uh, global oil consumption is around 87 million barrels of oil per day. And what is going to happen to it? This is a huge number, this is a big number. And 96% uh, of the global transport sector at the moment relies on the fossil fuels. And in future, in the predictions are that this is going to increase by 30%, which is a significant increase. As the population increases, the demand for energy increases. So this is going to significantly increase. And uh, uh, as the direct result of that, the emissions, um, specifically CO2, into the environment is also increasing, which is, uh, we can see from the plenty of the plots, we can always see that uh, since 1940, the level of CO2 has gone up linearly. And if we want to control it, we need to bring in new catalytic materials, new chemical reactions, and new reactors. So we need a right catalyst and a right reactor to achieve energy efficient processes. This is the roadmap which is given by the International Renewable Energy Agency. As we can see, that the population is increasing, the demand for energy is increasing. So the recommendation is we should double the share of the renewables. So by 2030, we should at least have 20% being blended by renewable energy. However, if you look at the current transportation, only 3% of the renewable biofuels are being blended into the current transport sector. 
So we need to blend at least 20% by now, but we are blending only up to 3%. So there is a huge gap that we need to fill in. So that's why uh, if we look at the potential, the potential is significant. We can make biofuels and that will help us to decrease at least 52 million metric tons by 2030 and 194 million metric tons of emissions by 2050, which is a 47% reduction from today. So if we want to decarbonize our environment, if we want to achieve the decarbonization, we need to, this is uh, mandatory, we do need to develop uh, technologies for renewable fuels and renewable chemicals. And how do we achieve that? For that, catalysis is one of the most important technologies. Because catalysis is robust, technologies using catalysts are clean, and 90% of the processes for manufacturing variety of different chemicals use catalysts. So what we need, the requirement of the hour is new materials, new catalytic materials, new chemical pathways or new chemical reactions using the new reactors. We need more energy efficient reactors, which are step ahead, which are more advanced from the traditional uh, type of the batch reactors so that we can achieve high energy efficiencies. We can perform these reactions under mild reaction conditions and we can achieve high convergence and high selectivities to the desired products. So this is uh, just a glimpse of what we are doing at Queens. So this is a catalytic biorefinery platform we have established here at Queens. We have got a number of different collaborations with a number of different fuel companies like uh, Chevron, Shell, BP, Oleon, Coriton Advanced Fuels, SHV Energy, and uh, it is combined with uh, catalyst manufacturing companies like Johnson Matthey. And we are looking at a huge range of number of uh, chemical transformations like uh, uh, ketonization of volatile fatty acids followed by alkylation to produce high quality aviation fuels. You're also looking at the way converting liability or converting waste materials into useful products, into value added products. So we are also looking at converting glycerol to man, mainly like glycerol diantriacetins, glycerol carbonate. We're also looking at uh, further reforming of glycerol for production of the hydrogen. We're also looking at the reactions for decarbonization where we can directly combine carbon dioxide with glycerol to make glycerol carbonate. We are also looking at further catalytic uh, reduction of the CO2 to produce methanol. So there, these are a number of uh, different efforts which we are taking here at Queens. These involve developing novel catalytic materials and novel catalytic pathways for production of biofuels, fuel additives, direct conversion of CO2 to products like carbonates, cyclic carbonates, glycerol carbonates, methanols, or uh, we can call them as solar fuels. So that's what we are trying to achieve here. These are the number of the exemplar uh, processes that we have established here for adding value to biomass derived chemicals like uh, furons, furfurals, hydroxymethyl furfurals, or bullet, uh, vegetable oils, volatile fatty acids, long chain fatty acids, and the uh, conversion of cellulose and grass to alkyl levulinates, which are the fuel additives, and also to glycerol carbonate and methanol. So the very first uh, oxide, metal oxide, which I'm going to talk about today is manganese oxide. So manganese oxide is highly versatile, it's porous in nature, and manganese is abundant earth element. So freely available, economically it is viable, it is not very expensive, it is easy for scale up, it is easy, and uh, large scale quantities are also available in the earth's crust. So one of the key chemicals which we can make is manganese oxide. Manganese oxide, a particular form of manganese oxide is octahedral manganese oxide molecular seeds. So these are uh, nano rod shaped materials. As you can see from the TEM here, we have got nano rod shaped uh, morphology of these materials here. You can see nice rods here, which are of the diameter of around 20 nanometers. They're hollow and porous from inside and the length of these materials is, can vary from 
100 to 500 nanometers, and uh, we can tune the surface area to around 100 to 120 square meters per gram. Nice crystalline porous unidimensional materials, which have got multiple oxidation states of manganese, and the structure is hungry. The structure is hungry for oxidation, oxygen, because it has got a huge number of lattice, lattice oxygen vacancies. Because of that, it's a very active catalyst for a number of organic transformations. For example, let us look at the selective hydrogenation of the aldehydes and ketones. We can easily convert the ketoisoprone to hydroxyisoprone or to leuthion by tuning the catalytic materials here. Very high selectivities in the order of 96% uh, at a very high conversion of 98% conversion can be achieved here. And uh, we can also look at the hydrogenation of the cinnamaldehyde. And using OMS2 hydrogenation of the cinnamaldehyde, we are getting the opposite trend here now. So if you look at the reaction at the top, we are taking out the carbon carbon double bond with platinum supported on manganese oxide. If you look at the reaction at the bottom here, we are taking out the carbon carbon carbonyl group here and we are getting the reduction to alcohol. So why is it showing us the different trends that at one hand we can selectively take out the carbon carbon double bond, or at the other hand, we can take out the carbonyl group. We can tune that, the key lies in the absorption, how we can tune the molecular absorption, how we can modify the molecular interaction of the carbonyl group or the carbon-carbon double bond that lies in the absorption geometry at the surface. And uh, we did, uh, with our colleague, uh, Professor Pejan, who we did a uh, lot of the FD calculations to look at the absorption of the molecules on the surface. And we also looked at the mechanism behind this. The mechanism was water-assisted dissociation of hydrogen. So direct dissociation was much more energy demanding, but the activation energy barriers were much lower in case if we had the water-assisted process here. So uh, the dissociation of hydrogen on the surface is the water-assisted process, and uh, the selectivity to the product is the function of the adsorption on the material, on the surface of the material. This can be extended also for the hydrogenation of the fertilizers and the molecules from the biomass of region. So for example, here on screen is shown the hydrogenation of the HMF to BHMF, which is one of the high energy density fuel additives. And we used uh, these materials, manganese oxide as catalysts, and you can see the comparison between manganese oxide and titanium dioxide. And uh, manganese oxide supported catalysts are performing very nicely. Actually, without even using any noble metal, you can use manganese oxides as a catalyst and achieve decent conversions and good selectivities to the desired products. So uh, another uh, story that I would like to tell is uh, a very important reaction, very important organic transformation that we are studying here at Queens. In case of the, in case of the anaerobic digesters, or hydrothermal liquefaction of the a variety of different uh, kind of biomass materials, the process waters that are achieved, these process waters are rich in short chain fatty acids. These are called as volatile fatty acids, which are in the range of C4 to C6, C5, C6 kind of the carboxylic acids. We can add value to these carboxylic acids by converting them to the cascade step, through the series of different steps of reactions, which are ketonization, alpha alkylation, followed by the hydrogenation. So by following these three different types of cascade reactions, we can directly produce aviation grade jet fuels from the volatile fatty acids, which are present in the process water of either from the hydrothermal liquefaction or obtained from the anaerobic digesters. So here is the scheme shown as, so in the UK here, we have got close to 500 uh, or 600 anaerobic digesters, and each of the anaerobic digesters has got plenty of volatile fatty acids uh, coming out of that. And uh, these are present up to 5% uh, or 6 or 7% in the waters, and the number of different studies are being performed at the moment to increase it to 10%. And these are in the range of C4, C5, C6 type of the carboxylic acids. And this is a chemistry, this is a pathway for the conversion of these acids 
to the long chain um, hydrocarbons, which are branched alkenes, which can be used as the advanced jet fuels. So the reaction pathway is two molecules of the acid react. The reaction is called as ketonization. It produces a ketone along with a molecule of water and CO2. And these ketones can be mixture of different ketones because we have got the mixture of different water and fatty acids. And these mixed ketones, then symmetric ketones or asymmetric ketones, depending on the type of the, whether it is a cross ketonization or a ketonization between the same molecule, this can then be alpha alkylated directly by reacting it with the renewable alcohols. So the alcohols also we are talking about are the biomass origin alcohols, renewable alcohols like hydroethanol or butanol or propanol, one butanol, which could be obtained renewably, which can be obtained sustainably. So we get alpha alkylated long chain, elongated chain ketones, which can directly be hydrogenated to branch alkenes. The advantage of this process is that on one hand, the feedstocks are dilute, the feedstocks are present in water, but the product which we make here is hydrocarbon, which is immiscible with water. So directly layer layer separation of the hydrocarbons from water is saving a lot of energy. So this is not an energy intensive operation to require to distill out the hydrocarbons from water. Because if you would go around separating the fatty acids from water, you will require a lot of energy. It will become an energy intensive process. But by following this series of successive cascade steps, we produce it into a water immiscible product. Then directly it becomes a liquid liquid separation, which is much more energy efficient process. Now, we have designed a nice uh, packed bed to continuous flow reactor for using this kind of uh, cascade reactions, which is here at Queens, and we can operate it uh, from gram scale to kilogram scale. And we also did uh, with one of the master's student, we did uh, techno economic uh, assessment using Aspen, and uh, we have demonstrated that uh, this can be scaled up and economically it will be feasible to scale it up. This reactions we have studied zirconium oxide and cerium zirconium oxide as the mixed metal oxides. So the hero of this story is zirconia, it's zirconium oxide. Again, zirconia is earth abundant metal oxide and plenty of zirconium oxide is available and the chemical industry is familiar with zirconia. So this is not like a surprise new metal or new materials for the chemical industry or the refinery industry. And uh, as we can see that we can modify these materials, the activity in ketonization is shown here. The zirconia, the pristine zirconia, it does show very high convergence, but over a range of very high convergence, the selectivity required to the ketones drops down because of the byproduct, which is being formed from the condensation of the ketones. So this is the aldol condensation of ketones that occurs, which is a base catalyzed reaction, which we don't want because that's a side reaction. So what we can do is uh, instead of zirconia, we can go with our friendly old uh, sulfated zirconia as a catalyst. And in that case, we can use sulfated zirconia material very nicely because you can see that selectivity is now near 100%. We can get 90, 99% selectivity to the desired ketones. And we can achieve high convergence per pass. <coughs> the reason we can achieve this very high selectivity using sulfated materials is because upon sulfation, the surface basic sites are covered, are neutralized, are killed. So then that inhibits the side reaction of the ketone and that limits that reaction and that stops the formation of the byproduct. So that's where we achieve very high convergence in selectivity using the sulfated material compared to the pristine zirconia. However, we can see that the conversions are lower compared to pristine zirconia. And we will fix that as well. So don't worry, no need to worry about that. We'll take care of that as well. So as you can see that uh, from moving from pristine to sulfated zirconia, uh, conversion drops, but selectivity improves. And we also compared it under ISO conversion levels to demonstrate that selectivity does improve uh, for the sulfated zirconia catalytic materials. So when we move from pure zirconia 
to the mixed metal oxide series zirconia, then we can achieve both very high conversions and very high selectivities as well. That's why mixed metal oxides sometimes perform even better than the individual metal oxides. And you will see that number of times during this talk today. And uh, in this case, then we did uh, do the sulfation of the mixed metal oxide catalyst as well. So using sulfated, so these are the optimized results. So there have been number of different uh, uh, optimization studies in terms of the composition of the materials, the precursor studies, the techniques for precipitation and uh, different optimization of the concentration of the sulfation. But they all have been done and they all have been taken care of. And the end result, the optimized result is that we can achieve very high conversion and very high selectivities close to 100%, nearly like 96% conversions with 98, 99% selectivity to the desired ketones through uh, sulfated cedar zirconia type of the catalytic materials. And uh, the materials are, you can see time on stream study here for 100 hours. It demonstrates that uh, up to 99.5% conversion can be achieved with 96% selectivity for near 100 hours without any catalyst deactivation. So these materials are robust. These materials are very stable under the reaction conditions. And not just the uh, acid as an exemplar reaction, we also looked at the model feedstocks where we moved into water. We had 90% of water present and 10% of the volatile fatty acids, and we did the reactions with that as well. So the results in front of you here on the slide, we can see that uh, close to 100% conversion and selectivities were achieved with 90% water being present. So again, this shows that these materials have very high hydrothermal stability in presence of water. And uh, these are really, really good catalytic and good and stable catalytic materials, which can be used for renewable fuels production for sustainable fuels. So in summary, uh, Metal oxides like sulfate zirconia and uh, mixed metal oxides like cedar zirconia within the sulfated form are very good, can assist us in terms of uh, developing the cascade type of processes for uh, manufacturing advanced jet fuels of the renewable origin. So we also look into how we can add value to glycerol. So glycerol is an important uh, feedstock, which is a byproduct produced from the biorefinery industry. And uh, in past 20 years, the quantities of the glycerol have increased. The availability of the feedstock has abundantly increased because the production of the biodiesel has linearly increased over the years, and it has continued to grow. And cost of glycerol has come down from about a dollar per kilo to down to five to 10 P per kilo now for the crude glycerol. I'm talking about for the impure glycerol. And uh, if we add value, for example, we convert glycerol to glycerol carbonate. Glycerol carbonate is a high energy density fuel additive. The value of this product is quite high compared to the crude glycerol. And uh, not only just fuel additive, it can also be used as solvent and uh, um, many range of the precursor for many different uh, uh, chemicals for manufacturing. And uh, if we use glycerol carbonate as the fuel additive, the advantage which we get is it increases the energy density of the fuel, it minimizes the emissions, it brings down the formation of the particulates, so soup formation it decreases, so that burns the fuel more cleanly that is much better in terms of the performance then. Glycerol can be converted into glycerol carbonate by two different pathways. So it can be converted by direct route by using CO2 as a carbonating agent, or it can be converted using an indirect route. The indirect route, route will require uh, agent transesterification agent like dimethyl carbonate or urea. The byproduct from the dimethyl carbonate will then be methanol, which can then again be utilized uh, recycled to make more dimethyl carbonate, or the byproduct from the urea would then be ammonia. But this can be recycled again. And uh, if we look at these two pathways, we can make glycerol carbonate very efficiently. So 
Looking at that, this study which we did was green synthesis of glycerol carbonate by mechanochemically prepared materials. So in this case, we used ball milling. We have uh, prepared our catalyst by milling. So uh, sodium aluminate type of catalyst were used by incorporating them on alumina as the catalyst. Again, earth abundant metal oxides, easily available in bulk and uh, can be scaled up very easily and very nice catalytic performance. We can see here that uh, compared to wet impregnated materials or physical mixture, the ball milled materials were much more stable. The recyclability studies showed that the efficiency of the materials could be improved by using milling mechanochemical grinding instead of the wet impregnation. So I'll come to that in a minute. And we tried many different uh, metal oxides and uh, like titania, silicon oxide, magnesium oxides, but aluminum oxide, alumina was the most robust material which we found. And in terms of uh, recyclability study also, it was good. Decent recyclability study was up to four recycles. We could reuse, recycle this material. It's cheap material, it's not very expensive. And uh, we can really use it uh, easily if we prepare this by mechanical methods. And uh, the advantage of using this method prepared by mechanical synthesis was it was not making any aluminum hydroxide on the surface, which we would find it from the uh, wet impregnation methods. So that's why this was more robust and a better recyclability. In terms of the direct route, we can directly capture CO2 from the air or from the pressurized uh, gas phase and then we can convert it into glycerol carbonate. So in this case, what we are using, we are using the dual function materials and we used uh, like calcium oxide, sodium oxide kind of materials. And uh, part of the material, the function of the metal oxide is to capture CO2 and the part of the other material is to react it to glycerol carbonate. And uh, this is the reactor setup shown here on screen. We have both kind of the reactors here on the left hand side, we have got the batch kind of the reactor. On the right hand side, we have got the continuous flow type of the reactor. So if anybody would like to ever uh, give it a go or try or um, evaluate their own materials using one of our facilities here, we have got a very fantastic uh, reaction engineering lab built up over here at Queens. And we have uh, a range of different uh, continuous flow reactors uh, for high pressure applications ranging from few milligrams to grams to kilogram scales. We can even pack like 100, 200 grams. So one of the technology has been scaled up with one of the local companies here to produce 100 kilo of the product per week. So we can scale it up. So if anybody would like to give a try, then just uh, drop me a line and we can definitely arrange uh, a visit for you to come and uh, test your catalytic materials over here. So in this particular study, we used uh, direct conversion of CO2 to capture, direct capture and conversion of CO2 to glycerol carbonate. We again uh, optimize the composition of the materials and we can see that 50-50 mix by weight of the materials of calcium oxide and the sodium oxide showed us the best conversion selectivity to glycerol carbonate. And the uh, robustness of the materials was tested into the continuous flow reactors. And again, you can see a very nice steady state performance with high selectivity and high conversions can be achieved for pass in the continuous flow reactors. Sometimes flow reactors have got their own advantages over the traditional batch reactor. You can definitely improve the productivity. And then we went through all of our standard uh, traditional processes like optimizing the reaction compositions and the mole ratios and temperature studies and like that. And we achieved a very nice production of the crystal carbonate through that. In another study, again, uh, very important from the sustainability point of view is the circular economic approach where we utilize a used cooking oil. So here what we do is we recycle the cooking oil. So we recycle the vegetable oils and convert them directly into the fuels. So that's the hydrogenation technology which we develop. Normally the hydrogenation of the triglycerides or the acids or this type of the molecules is very difficult. It's very demanding. The temperatures required are 200, 250 degrees. The pressures required are 100, 150, 200 bars. 
very difficult. And the traditional old style cathodic materials used like chromium oxides or chromates and copper zinc chromides. And these are really, really uh, potentially toxic chemicals to use and hazardous and carcinogenic type of materials. So doing these reactions under very high, very extreme conditions of temperature and pressure and using this kind of catalyst, absolutely not advisable. In our group, what we do is the philosophy is to develop the processes using mild reaction conditions, low temperatures, low pressures, enhance the catalytic activities, use better catalytic materials and use better reaction technologies, better reactors to achieve more efficiency and increase the yield of the product. So in this case, again, with Professor Pejin, who's uh, DFT calculations, we predicted what should be the pathway on the metal oxide materials that will use the lowest activation energy barriers. So we came up with a mixture of the two metal oxides, um, platinum and rhenium, and uh, we tried many different uh, supports. Titanium was the most suitable support here. We tried platinum on titanium, on cerium, on zirconia, on silicon, on alumina, and range of different supports. And we found out that the most suitable was titanium because it's a reducible metal oxide. So it, again, it has got the oxygen vacancies in the lattice structure of titanium. And where the carbonyl molecule, the carbonyl group of the molecule will sit in, and it will help to weaken the carbonyl bond and break it easily. And that is why these reactions can be done under mild reaction conditions. So as you can see that we have prepared nice uh, monometallic and bimetallic platinum, platinum, radium type of materials supported on titanium and the particle size distribution is very narrow and in the range of one to two nanometers, very small nanoparticles. And uh, we studied them for direct hydrogenation of the triacetin as the triesterin as the model substrate for representing the triglyceride for representing the oils. And uh, by tuning between the monometallic and bimetallic catalyst, we can selectively achieve 100% conversions and very high selectivity either to hydrocarbons or to alcohols. Both are excellent products. Alcohols are the products which are used into the oleochemicals as oleochemicals and a variety of different applications. And uh, hydrocarbons, long chain hydrocarbons, applications as green diesel. So directly can be blended uh, straight away into the transportation fuels. So useful products and we can tune selectivity to both sides, depending on what we want to achieve. We tried this into the range of different vegetable oils like palm, sunflower oil, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, coconut oil, rapeseed oil, all of them. We could achieve very high selectivities, high 90s, 95 to 100% selectivities to alkanes, or we could have very high selectivities in the range of 80 to 90% towards the alcohols directly from the oils. So it saves a lot of um, steps, you know, the traditional uh, chemistry would require taking the oils and then uh, doing the reforming of that and steam reforming to break down the triglycerides into corresponding fatty acids. And these fatty acids then will be hydrogenated to alcohols. So it's a complicated process, requires a lot of number of different unit operations. However, we can hear directly in one step, hydrogenated down to alcohols or the alkenes as we require. And uh, you can see the reaction conditions are pretty mild, 20 bar and 130 degrees temperature, which is much, much wide, milder compared to what we saw in the uh, traditional practices. So again, we uh, studied the uh, steric acid as a model substrate to understand more about the mechanism behind the reaction and kinetics behind the reaction so that we can design the reactors for that. And uh, we studied uh, the reusability of the catalyst was decent. However, if we can see that when we recover the catalyst in the bimetallic materials, recovered materials, we had to wash it, dry it, calcine it, pre-reduce it, number of steps here. However, whenever we do all these number of steps here, there's always a possibility that we lose the interface between the bimetallic catalyst, which we don't want to do that. And that's why uh, traditional uh, batch reactors, are not really that efficient. But if we move towards a continuous flow 
and we do the hydrogenation from the continuous flow reactors, that is much better because now the catalyst will not be exposed and we don't need to recover the catalyst, wash it, dry it, and calcine it, and then again do the pre reduction and uh, lose all the metal metal contact in that. So again, there is another high pressure continuous flow reactor that we have designed in Queens and uh, again, another beautiful shining reactor. We have studied continuous flow hydrogenations here and we can easily reduce acids to corresponding alcohols or alkenes with very high selectivity and high stability over time on stream and under mild reaction conditions. Another advantage is that uh, we can make this catalyst mechanochemically. So mechanochemically, again, we can grind it. And as you can see here, that we can easily achieve the narrow particle size distribution with mean average particle size of 1.2 nanometers of platinum, which is even better than what we were getting through the incipient wetness technique or the wet information techniques for making this kind of materials. So mechanochemical materials here are very good. Um, we compared it with the traditional catalytic materials and we've got higher selectivities and higher catalysts with mechanochemically prepared catalytic materials. So again, another advantage of one of the green chemistry practices in our lab here. In summary, we can make materials using mechanochemistry. We can perform reactions under mild reaction conditions. We can tune the selectivity both to alcohols or alkanes and we can achieve very high conversions and selectivities at low temperature and low pressure conditions. And these are useful reactions. Another story that I would like to talk about today is photocatalysis, uh, photocatalytic deforming of glycerol here, because hydrogen is one of the important uh, player in the sustainable world for our uh, near future. It's going to play a big role in the energy arena in terms of renewable energy, in terms of uh, uh, sustainable future we are talking about here. So we tried the conversion of glycerol photocatalytically. So for that, again, we have another continuous flow type of the reactors where we have got the tubes which are coated. As you can see, we have got both batch reactors here and continuous flow reactors here. In the continuous flow reactors, the tubes are from inside, you can see on the screen here, the quartz tubes are coated with titania and then annealed, it becomes transparent. These are supported with platinum nanoparticles throughout the tube. These are transparent tubes can be very efficiently used for photocatalysis. And uh, this is the example of hydrogen evolution. You turn on the lights, you get hydrogen evolution, switch off the light, then no hydrogen production, and turn on the lights again, and you can see the lights again, hydrogen production. You can purge it with green, green with nitrogen. You can see that uh, Again, hydrogen production comes on when you switch on the lights. Um, so this is a very robust and stable catalyst and can be recycled and can be used a number of times. In fact, master's student used the same tube for entire six months of his project and um, he never really had to make any other tubes again because the tubes were so robust, we were not losing, nothing was filling out of it. So very stable performance was achieved. So student was happy and the project also worked good and hydrogen was also produced. And uh, we don't need to go out and make these tubes again and again, we make them once and forget about them. Another project that I would like to talk about is photocatalytic reduction of the CO2 to methanol. Again, uh, as what we can see from here, the traditional approach is using metal oxides like zinc oxides or modified metal oxides. And uh, the reactions are, the key challenges of this reaction would be CO2 to methanol is a multiphasic reaction. So you have gas, liquid, solid type of reactors, and you also have photons there now. So you need to enhance the mass transfer. You need to enhance gas liquid and liquid solid mass transfer, and you need to bring in the light on the surface of the and then you need to combine all of that together. So it's really, really a reaction engineering problem. And the current methods, the photonic efficiencies are low and the lifespan of the charge careers is very low because of the charge recombination. So what happens is on the surface of the metal oxide, when you shine light onto it, it generates the pair of holes and electrons, which then either recombine because of the surface recombination, then the efficiency is poor. 
And uh, because of these electrons, then we can reduce CO2 to a number of different products, which are called as solar fuels. We can go to methane, CO, methanol, like that. So what requires here is better catalyst and better reactors, not just better catalyst, but better catalyst and better reactors. So we have a dual fold approach here. So this is called as direct Z scheme photocatalysis. Again, this is based on metal oxides. So in this case, we have got uh, a traditional Z scheme in which you combine two metal oxides. So when you shine light on one metal oxide, it generates electron hole pairs. And as you can see on my screen here, the hole is here in the valence band and the electrons jump up to the conduction band. Then with the presence of the other metal oxide and presence of the charge transfer agents, these electrons from the conduction band of one metal oxide can be transported to another metal oxide. So if you transport it to the hole of the another metal oxide, it there combines with the hole of this second metal oxide. Okay, so what happens here is now the electrons which were excited on the second metal oxide, they are on far away from the holes on the first metal oxide here. So we achieve enhanced separation of the charge carriers. So you are using two metal oxides here. So we use two metal oxides. We have oxidation photocatalyst and reduction photocatalyst. On one metal oxide, which is an oxidation photocatalyst, we have got the holes, which are used for oxidation of water. On another metal oxide, which has got the electrons on it, which is used for reduction of the CO2 to methanol. So traditional scheme is to use uh, the combination of the metals here, like either platinum or copper oxides, or using the graphene, like carbon-based materials here, which is more complicated type of the catalytic system here. The more advanced system is the direct Z scheme. Instead of the traditional Z scheme, we are using direct Z scheme photocatalysis here. So here you have the combination of the two metal oxides, which is photooxidation catalyst and photoreduction catalyst. So in this case, we are using zinc oxides and again, manganese oxides, which is a friend of us and we have been using them for several years in our lab. And as I said that this is uh, not just about the catalyst, this is also about the reactor. So we have designed a new reactor, which is again a boat batch as well as the continuous flow type of the reactor for this type of the reactions that we can do here. And in our reactor here, we can shine two different type of lights at the same time. So we can not only control the wavelength of the light, we can control the intensity of the light also, and we can change it from batch to the continuous flow type of the reactors. So as you can see here on the next slide here, that we have got two different combination of the metal oxides. We have got the zinc oxide as the oxidation photocatalyst and manganese oxide as the reduction photocatalyst. So in this case now, what we do is uh, we combine these two metal oxides. Zinc oxide absorbs light in the UV region. It absorbs light around 370, 376, depending on the synthesis of the material. And uh, the metal oxides like copper oxide or manganese oxide, they absorb strongly in the visible region. So for example, the absorption will be much higher in the region of uh, uh, orange light or red light here. So what we do is we combine these two metal oxides. So again, mechanochemically, we grind the two metal oxides to achieve very high molecular level mixing between the two photocatalysts. And then we use them and compare the performance. So on the left hand side here, you can see production of the methanol. And, uh, which is again much better from what we, we can see out there in the literature. We can individually, this is the reaction which is on the left hand side panel is done using just the UV light and zinc oxide is performing best here. But on the right hand side, you can see how this catalyst we moved from individual metal oxide to the mixed metal oxide. So we moved to the direct Z scheme. And here we are shining two lights. We have got the UV light, as well as we have got the presence of the red light here. And the combination of the two lights, now we can see that the presence of the mixed metal oxides, the performance is 
much better compared to the individual zinc oxide or the manganese oxide here. So by tuning the methyl oxides, by tuning, by combining them in the Z scheme format, and by using the right kind of the reactor where you can shine two wavelengths, two light wavelengths at the same time, you can produce uh, much higher quantities of methanol and achieve much faster reaction rates here for production. So that's, that's definitely uh, both uh, band gap engineering as well as reaction engineering. This is the material science as well as uh, designing the proper reactor to achieve high efficiency in this kind of the reactors. So in a nutshell, if I would like to summarize, the summary is uh, through this number of different stories which we are developing in our lab here, we can demonstrate why metal oxides are our friends, why metal oxide catalysts are robust, hydrothermally stable, highly efficient, porous, and uh, commercially scalable and economically viable materials. And that's the reason I hope uh, that answers why the metal oxide materials are the materials that hold the key to the sustainable future. Because these are the materials, these are the catalysts, these are the enabling technologies that will help us to develop sustainable technologies of the future with high efficiency and uh, high performance uh, in manufacturing. That will help us to achieve our net zero performance. So uh, I would like to acknowledge because this has been a big team effort. A number of different people have contributed, both our academic collaborators as well as uh, different uh, groups have contributed uh, strongly into this research and a number of postdocs and PhD students. This is our group here at Queens. And also not to forget the most important contribution has been through the funding agencies to support this research like uh, EPSRC, Neighborhood Trust, UK Catalysis Hub, Royal Society, the Bryden Center, and the companies like uh, Chevron, Oleon, Almac, Johnson Mate, SHP Energy, and Center for Advanced Sustainable Energy, which is through Invest Northern Ireland. So everybody has contributed significantly to keep the research and keep the projects going in the lab. So uh, I think uh, that's uh, where I would like to stop. And if there are any questions, then I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Haresh. Um, uh, thanks for a really interesting and comprehensible talk. Um, there is one question already in the Q&A, um, which is, uh, if we can use a char as a support for the materials and then use that for catalysis, will that be better? So this came in at about half time, so one of the earlier examples. Yeah, uh, it can be used and it does depend on the surface area of the char that we are making, the reaction that we are intending to use it into and also the presence of the other metals or the metal impurities in the char. So not to forget that the char which we get will be coming in from the biomass region will have a range of different metals present into it already. So we need to be mindful of what is present in our material. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, another question is how many cycles can be done by using metal oxides as the metals tend to get poisoned? <laughs> that depends on the reaction. And uh, one of the metal oxides which we used, uh, we packed it into the column and we left it there to run every day for 36 days without changing it. And it was stable and performed greatly. And after that, I had to change it because we are academic lab, we are at university, so I cannot afford to run it uh, for a long time. But in chemical industry, it can be used uh, at least for a year without changing it. That Very robust materials. Thank you. Um, so Ibias asks, oh, so thank you very much for a nice presentation. There's a few thanks for an excellent presentation coming in on the chat as well. Um, and he wanted to know, oh, sorry, I don't know the gender, I'm, I'm assuming a gender. They wanted to know that if you can share the, the direct Z scheme reactor. Yeah, I would be happy to share it. And if anybody wants to try it, uh, then just send me an email and uh, we can work out what needs to be done on it. So I'll be happy to share it. That, that's the reason to bring the catalysis community together. So that's the purpose of the UK Catalysis Hub. 
So I'd suggest that you you drop Haresh an email and he can send that to you. Um, <laughs> Ferdus asks, what is the fate of the catalyst after they finish the journey? Well, uh, we regenerate it and we recycle it. So we believe in circular economy. So we need to use it uh, again and again and again. So that, that's the purpose. So, so once uh, you use it for several months or several, like one or two years on the column in the reactor in the plant, then you regenerate it and you recycle it again. And then um, there's a question about the eco-friendliness of the manganese oxide catalysts. So how we consider the eco-friendliness of using the manganese? Of course, we have to consider it. And it definitely is a highly eco-friendly material. It is one of the most earth abundant metal oxides. So it's, I think this is second most earth abundant metal oxide after iron oxide. And it is already being used at the industrial scale. So we, we can use it and uh, it is eco-friendly. So um, Haney has a couple of questions. The first yeah. question is how is the organic substrate uh, mixed with the metal oxide and what kind of light was used to make the catalyst work? So I'm assuming this is in the photocatalytic reactor. So basically what we do is uh, first we start with the metal oxide and we do the UV visible absorption spectroscopy. And from the UV visible absorption spectroscopy, you can measure each metal oxide and find out where is the lambda max, where is the maximum absorption. Then using that, using the talk plots, we can calculate the band gap. So once you know the band gap energies of different metal oxides, then you tune and you pick the two metal oxides in which one of them has got the higher activation or higher band gap energy and the other one which has got the lower band gap energy. And you can match the conduction and the balance band, bring them closer. So you need to look at the energy band diagrams. That is called as a band gap engineering. That will help you pick the right kind of the metal oxides for your reaction. And then you see where it is absorbing maximum and shine that light. And we have 10 different wavelengths we can vary in our reactor. So one of them will definitely fit with it. Thank you. Um, for those asking for Haresh's email, I've put his uh, university web page in the chat so you can get all his contact details from there. Um, Anya would like to know um, what the extraction process for getting the metals used in the catalysis and is it sustainable? Um. Uh, what is the question? Extraction process for getting the metals? Yeah, so it's a right. mining so, process, I presume. Uh, yeah, so we are not doing extraction of the metals here, but uh, as I said, again, going back to if we are looking at the earth abundant metal oxides, uh, iron oxide, manganese oxides, it is definitely much more sustainable than using platinum and palladium and iridium and ruthenium and rhodium type of materials. It will be environmentally much more sustainable. Um, thank you. Um, light used during the catalysis experiment. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to explain. So the material will absorb the light and that's what you need to find out by band gap engineering. So that will be useful in the reaction then. Okay, so it's catalyst dependent. Um, Ferdus has, uh, do you think it's better to use electricity driven vehicles or rather should we replace our fuels with biofuels? Like I already said that uh, the crude oil reserve is such a big resource of energy and only 3% of that is being used as renewable biofuels. The same is true for the electricity and uh, for the electricity driven vehicles. If you look at the proportion, none of this single technology is going to be able to replace the crude oil resource because it is such a huge resource. So everything has to come in together. So if both of them are equally important and you need both because one of them cannot do, cannot just go out and replace oil. Well, and not all transport mechanisms will be available to be electrified yes. as well. Uh, or oh, that's my understanding. Um, 
so the next question is um, any idea on the development of a kind of photothermal reduction of CO2 using metal oxides? Yeah, we already have the metal oxides. Currently at the moment, we are only operating it as photocatalytic one because it is being done at the room temperature. But this can also be done into photothermal way by increasing the temperature. And uh, that will change the product we are making. So it will change the selectivity. If you want to tune it from methanol to methane, you can play with it, can be done. Um, so thanks for a very nice presentation. In the cooking oil or vegetable oil transformations, high conversion and selectivity were achieved at 130 degrees C. What was the solvent system and how important is the role of catalysts to facilitate the reaction at below boiling point of the reactant? And how much dosage of catalyst was used? I think we have uh, uh, a number of different questions here. So, <laughs> yeah. So we used the 50-50. So we used 50-50 because we tried to use 100% oil directly, but uh, the solubility of the hydrogen gas there was quite low. So we used 50-50 mix of the oils with the solvents, which were hydrocarbons there. And uh, by that, uh, you can enhance the hydrogen solubility as well. So you can achieve better mass transfer and you can achieve better con conversions there. And how important is the role of the catalyst? that can facilitate the reaction below the boiling point of the reaction. That is very important because, uh, as I said, we believe in improving the energy efficiency. So we believe in performing the reactions at low temperatures and milder reaction conditions. So if you tune the metal oxide, as I had explained it, uh, that uh, there are a number of different activation energy barriers depending on the combination of the metal oxides. So if we are choosing the metals like platinum, rhenium, and we are going for titania, then these are very, very efficient and can be done under mild reaction conditions. Otherwise, if you go like copper chromate, then you need 200 degrees and 250 degrees temperature. Okay, so Ibias asks if you're using a ball mill and how did you prepare the catalysts? Yes, we are using the ball mill and we are using planetary ball mill and we tried many different precursors of metals and metal oxides and metal carbonyls, and we compared them. And metal oxides seem to perform very well for milling them and making them the material. Okay, so Abdul asks, um, what you have done to counter HER reaction in CO2 conversion, which is a competing reaction for the CO2 reduction? Band gap engineering. So these are occurring on two different metal oxides. So hydrogen evolution reaction will occur on the oxidation catalyst and CO2 reduction will occur on the reduction photocatalyst. So by tuning the metal oxides, you can tune the performance of that. Interesting. Um, Haini also asks, is the quantum yield calculated? Yes, one of my postdoc is working on that at the moment. <laughs> so she, she apologizes for so many questions. She does a lot of work in this area. She's obviously very interested. Yeah. Well, no, definitely. If they want to talk to me individually after that or send me an email or put a Teams call, I'll be happy to talk to them. Um, so uh, this question is, how economic turning fatty acids to fuels via a cascade process as the fatty acid only presents in trace in process water? Yeah, so we did the techno-economic assessment at the large scale as a, a master's MH chemical engineering design project. And uh, based on the assessment using Aspen on the techno-economic assessment, it is economically feasible. It can be, it can make you money. Okay. And uh, we went conservatively at 3%. But uh, the colleagues which are generating these feedstocks have given us that uh, they have 6% of acid present in their solutions. But we assumed only 3%, but we were still making money. Okay. Um, and we'll take this as the last question. Um, have you tried uh, MOFs for this process and done a comparative study with metal oxides? No, we have not tried MOFs yet, but uh, would be interesting to try. So if somebody has a mouth, they have made it and want to try it, either they are welcome to come here and try it or send us the material and we can try it. But we have not tried it yet. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a quick last question that's come in. We'll take this as a very, very last. Uh, you mentioned about jet fuel. 
we can work on using oh, it's not i think it's a statement rather than a question that they're working on jet fuel using palm kernels palm kernel oil yeah so yeah, um, can be utilized that we already have covered a range of different oils and we did have an example of palm oil into it so it can be utilized it can be used and it can be both it can be fresh oil it can be the used oil as well So thank you very much. Um, so how can we increase the surface area of the metal oxide? So, uh, for example, uh, when you compare zirconium oxide with uh, salt gel prepared uh, mesoporous zirconium oxide, you can increase the surface area by four times. So synthesis, by, by tuning the hydrothermal synthesis, you can increase the metal oxide or you can disperse the metal oxide on a high surface area material. For example, you start with silica, and uh, uh, mesoporous silica has got the surface area of around 800, 900 square meters per gram. And if you disperse metal oxide onto it, you can achieve a highly dispersed metal oxide with higher surface area. So it's material science, and uh, engineering your materials can be done. Um, I think that was the, the last question to come in. So thank you very much, Resh. And you can see by the questions that obviously a really, really interesting and uh, topic with lots of people sort of uh, very grateful for your excellent talk. So thank you again. No, um, actually, I'm thankful that everybody was listening to me. That's why there are so many questions. So uh, thanks a lot to everybody for their attention as well. So. Um, so I, I put a link to Haresh's um, university page in the chat um, if you want to get in contact with Haresh or just search for him on the Queen University Belfast pages. There's also a link to our full webinar series, um, so please register for future webinars and watch this space as we continue to develop the programme. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and thank you again, Haresh. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for inviting me for the talk today. I look forward to seeing you at future events. Uh, have a lovely weekend and goodbye. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Arish. Bye.